Hi, everybody. So thanks so much for coming along to this afternoon's panel discussion and workshop for the Direct Entry Program SIG. I'd just like to introduce the two conveners of the Direct Entry Program SIG. Uh, so we have Marie, Matt and Marie Wright from University of Western Australia Centre for English Language Teaching, and Marie and I do from UNSW Global, who are your conveners, and they're going to be moderating the panel and facilitating today's workshop. Thanks so much for organising this workshop for the SIG members, Anne-Marie and Maria, over to you. Thanks so much, Sophie, and thank you for your support in getting us all here this afternoon. Um, so I think we might get started. Last year at this pre-conference session, our focus was on strategies to maintain our own well-being in the face of the profound challenges we were all facing as a result of the enormous disruption to our sector. A year on, on Are You OK Day, and I hope you are all OK, um, the nature of our challenges is very different as we venture into or deepen our skills in delivering in different modes, responding to a need, of, a need for greater flexibility, exploring new offerings, and tackling really big issues such as the shortage of ELICOS teachers. This year, with our sector in recovery, we felt we should turn our attention back to our core business of preparing postgrad and undergraduate students for university study. Anne-Marie and Sophie and myself are so pleased to welcome you all to this afternoon's conversation. And we look forward to pooling the expertise in this virtual space, our amazing DEP tribe, to learn from one another's experiences and insights and to respond to new and emerging student needs. So I'll hand over to Anne-Marie to welcome our panel as well. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> Today, we're going to explore this through a 30 minute panel discussion. And then we're going to have a workshop for about 10 minutes where um, you're all invited to comment on the panel discussion um, as an audience. And then we're going to have some breakout rooms where we'll discuss this further. And we have three questions for you to explore a little more in the breakout rooms. And then we'll come back to discuss any pertinent points that you made in the rooms and, and some things that you'd like to discuss further or food for thought, things to take home and think about. So let me introduce our panel for our first section. We're delighted to welcome four fantastic experts today. Firstly, Dr. Sharon Black, Senior Project Officer, Accreditation and Quality Assurance at UNSW. Welcome, Sharon. Elise Fraser, Director of Wellbeing and Student Experience at RMIT Training. Welcome, Elise. Cameron Lidster, Learning Advisor at Bond University. And Jason West, Director of Studies ELT, English Language Programs, UTS College. So thank you very much, panel. So let me ask our first question for you today. And it's quite a, a meaty one, a big one. So I'll, I'll try and go slowly um, to break it down a bit. Um, for Sharon and Cameron in particular, in thinking about universities and the change in the last three years, and the DEP curriculum content and program outcomes, has the definition of university ready shifted through the COVID-19 pandemic? Is there anything more or different that direct entry programs need to do to make future students uni ready? I'll open it up to Sharon and Cameron. Sharon? Uh, yeah, so you're right, it is a fairly meaty question, isn't it? There's a lot <laughs> packed into that. Um, um, and I guess uh, I can only offer a perspective from, I guess, what I see at UNSW. And we talked briefly before jumping onto this session about the fact that some unis were back, back on campus, everything's delivered face to face. Some unis are still operating at a solely online level. At UNSW, we're very much in the hybrid space at the moment, and we don't look like going full-time 
back on campus anytime soon. So when I thought about that question about getting students uni ready, you know, thinking about it from the academic and English language preparedness, but also for the learning that's happening in this space at the moment. So one of the things that we're finding is there is very little student engagement, um, both face to face and in the online space. So when I do think about um, how to better prepare students for coming to university now, I think there needs to be perhaps some focus on learning in hybrid modes, how it's done, um, how you engage yourself as a, a student in that particular style of learning. And you might be flipping from one to the other consistently, depending on whether you're onshore or offshore. Um, I have no real suggestions for how we do this. We're all grappling with this, particularly, you know, in my space in the business school. But we as educators need to focus on how we bring students on board and to study in those hybrid spaces. How do we motivate them? How do we shift that mindset from the fact that your lecturer might have the lecture online and you can access at any time, but how do we motivate ourselves to actually listen to that lecture? I know as a student, I probably would have been a little bit lazy and may or may not have got to it. So there's a lot of content being missed out on and the key focus seems to be as long as we do our assessments and submit them, all will be good. So that's one way that I feel that we perhaps need to prepare students differently um, in the future. But I'll hand over to you, Cameron, so I don't hog the talk space. No, that's, that's terrific, Sharon. Thank you for that. And look, my first reaction was engagement slash participation in the classroom. I think with the new technologies, it's just so easy to turn your webcam off and turn your microphone off and uh, say that you're studying and say that you're participating. I'm online at the same time, but in fact, no, they're, they're not engaged or they're not participating as we would like them to be, um, as they were in, in the classroom. So participation, I think, is a key, um, let's say, I don't want to say problem, I want to say it's an opportunity for us to think about how we engage students to participate online, hybrid, back in the classroom. Um, the new technologies, Zoom, Teams, etc. you know, there have been great opportunities to upskill. I think it has kind of affected negatively to that engagement participation. I think the new technologies have also created different genres of assessment. So things like voice over PowerPoint recordings uploaded onto YouTube and then presented live during a class time. I, I don't think that was something that was happening, you know, pre-2019, pre-2020. So that kind of um, type of assessment with uh, and a focus on authentic assessment as well. Uh, I'm finding a lot of students working on reflective essays, reflections on their learning, et cetera, et cetera. And really, a lot of the motivation there is academic integrity. Um, at the moment, that's the key phrase uh, across Australia in the higher education sector. It's academic integrity concerns. And I feel like I'm hearing it, reading it, talking about it almost every day. I mentioned new technologies. There's new technologies uh, such as AI paraphrasing software. Uh, if you do a Google search for Quillbot, uh, you'll be quite surprised if you haven't come across that yet. But uh, look, the engagement, participation, the new technologies, academic integrity, they're, they're the three things for me. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that, um, Cameron. We have huge issues around academic integrity. And I know in a lot of our programs, we're going back to look at content, um, to include all those authentic assessments because that, you know, that's the buzz thing that we're doing now. And, and it's great, we should be doing it. I'm not saying we shouldn't, um, but around that, with the, the whole conversation around academic integrity, particularly in places where it's solely online or you're in that hybrid mode is, is really who's taking this class, who's producing the work at the end of the day, who's submitting the work. So 
there's a lot in our space to think about and learn about a little bit more. I guess I'd never heard of Quillbot and we'll be Googling that straight away. Um, so there's a lot that we need to learn um, in terms of how we educate our students moving forward and what that looks like. Mm. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll keep any questions to a little bit later. Um, Maria, did you want to move on to our second question? I will do, thanks. So um, we'll direct this question to you, Jason, and we'll start with you and then move over to Elise. So our previous um, speakers have spoken about being uni ready and some of the demands in needing to um, you know, become familiar with the hybrid space and what and how to engage in it, for example. The second question is more in relation to preparing students to succeed at university. And I guess we're talking there about academic success. So in thinking about the student experience in the last three years, how should direct entry programs be better supporting students for that academic success? What should we be focusing on? So Jason, could we start with you? Um, definitely. Um, thanks very much, Maria and uh, English Australia team. Um, look, I, I thought a good place to start for this would be to, um, for, from the mental health uh, SIG, uh, Anita Van Ruen gave us a definition for um, what effective mental health looks like. And I thought that was just a really good place to start. And the definition she gave us was living our best and most confident life. So I think if we can think about that and translate that back to what can direct entry programs do to set students up for success so that they can live their most, um, uh, their best and most confident life. And, and for me, there are three core things. Um, the first is obviously language competence. We've got to remember that we need to focus on proficiency first. So um, just reflecting on Cameron's comment um, about the, um, uh, the reflective thinking skills what can we do to build in um, endurance um, uh, around mental health, around um, giving students confidence to uh, address the language um, requirements that are, that are needed for success at university? So one of the things that we've been doing, for example, is taking our curriculum and mapping back the graduate attributes that we um, that we aspire for students to have when they when they complete and graduate from UTS, um, and mapping those back to um, into our curriculum and saying, uh, what are the touch points through the direct entry program that we can um, uh, support students to set them up for success? So we want students to not just have the linguistic skills, which of course is our main focus, but also to have broader skill set. Um, and that includes, for example, intercultural competence, how to use pragmatics so that they can have conversations and build better uh, collaborations with other students. Um, the second point, was um, really thinking about student community. So again, thinking about how the academic program links in really strongly with um, academic community um, in terms of what students can do to, to connect with other students. How can we leverage the use of peer-to-peer -peer relationships and peer-to-peer -peer support, um, particularly, for example, senior or advanced students that can provide a, um, additional support to students as they, as they journey through their, through their um, pathway through their um, direct entry program. And then, um, so that's the second point, um, is building those stronger connections both within students, but also making sure that the student voice is heard throughout um, the, the process, such as through student advisory groups. Um, and then we're responding to that with, uh, with how students are, are managing the academic content so that we're constantly fine tuning. And then the third point was to build uh, 21st century skills. So these include um, the kinds of resilience that we're talking about uh, for students to have so that they can deal with multiple um, situations that they might not have come across before. We've got volatility, uh, uncertainty, um, complexity and ambiguity. And in order to deal with those, um, let's um, build in resilience into our programming, our core curriculum, so that students can access the support they need through say HELPS, HELPS is our, um, uh, additional support outside of class, um, language support, what can we do to build strong connections there so students can access those resources and, you, and really leverage the peer support? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Lots of food for thought there. Elise, would you like to build on that? 
Yes, and probably um, sort of uh, taking a slightly different tack as well, because my background is um, uh, as a counsellor and psychotherapist and uh, from, you know, a fine art background, although I've spent a lot of time um, in, in Alicos and in education generally. But in uh, at the beginning of 2020 um, at RMIT training, we shifted our focus more towards a positive psychology model. So simply put, what we were trying to do was focus more so on what's strong than, than what's wrong. So positive psychology is about things like cultivating kindness, uh, prioritizing close relationships, finding your flow, expressing gratitude and discovering your strengths. And, and character strengths generally has been really important for us. So in the first year of COVID, um, we rolled out a project around kindness and the science behind kindness and how the whole um, community can benefit from kindness in a challenging time. And it really changed the conversation and provided a foil to a lot of the um, misery that was associated with thwarted plans, um, with isolation, with loneliness. And it also um, redirected some of our collective anxiety towards um, loss of agency into a sense of still having some agency in some important aspects of our lives. So the focus became more about looking after our community through acts of kindness. And that was a great way of sort of supporting students through very, very tough times. The following year, um, as the lockdowns uh, rolled on, particularly in Melbourne, we in interrogated the character strength of hope. And there was a whole series of discrete projects that um, had um, both um, implicit and explicit me messaging. And we really sort of um, uh, decided to focus in on hope because we just noticed this waning optimism and that it was really um, impacting young people's um, well-being. And we, we wanted to actively build that up again. So two years of lockdown might be so bad when you're 40 or 50 or older than that, but when you're only 18 or 19 or 20, it's a very big part of your life. And um, two years of being scared, of having events cancelled, of... Um, rapidly losing your nascent social skills uh, was a very, very big deal for young people. And, and I think that the world had become a scary place and it, it's still very scary at the moment for young people. It's very unstable and, and students are tuned into it and aware of that. And I think that there's sort of been this sort of hypervigilance that's developed um, through living with all of these existential threats and, and, and adding to that the collision of um, home cultures with the host country culture, um, exciting for some students, very destabilising for other students. Mm. So um, some of the other things that we've done is we have uh, wellbeing student experience and academic support teams that work within the same area. And um, what we've tried to do is really ensure that students don't fall between the gaps because there's a lot of gaps in services in institutions, um, you know, where one service sort of starts and another service ends. Um, so yeah, we've really tried to get everything joined up um, to support their academic achievement. And um, in this last period, it, there's a sense of optimism. Um, we've noticed that students are very, very keen as they return to campus to um, enjoy some of the rites of passage that they haven't had um, at home and they're very keen to learn about a new culture so um, and job skills um, you know that kind of thing so we've had programs that have really supported um, learning those kinds of skills feeling um, that they that they have a range of knowledge that is going to allow them to sort of participate fully in society um, even even if they're sort of first jobs that they're going out to get um, the other thing that we've done is we've focused in on respectful relationships because we've noticed that there's a lot of um, anxiety that's about holding a different position and feeling that students really need to hold that position. So tensions between more conservative and more progressive views, different political views, the, you know, are, am I Taiwanese, am I Ch Chinese kind of tensions that exist. So um, we've also really been focusing in on trying to um, get students to be more cognitively flexible, less judgmental, less, less rigid, so that um, 
you know, they, they can sort of uh, be actively interested in what's going on, but they don't get stuck in views that are not necessarily even their own views, but that they've sort of felt that they needed to kind of, there's a security in sticking with them. So um, we've, we, it's great, it's Are You OK Day today, and we've been cooking pancakes and uh, you know, putting out a lot of messaging about that. But we've also got involved um, very much this year in Pride Week, um, very important sort of um, you know, educational campaign there. Um, we'll pick up on Mental Health Awareness Week, um, Reconciliation Week, and encouraging everyone, all of the, the um, staff and students to be really curious about um, these different kind of issues and, um, you know, not ignorant and, and, and not dismissive of, of how tightly the, and how important they are to maybe people who aren't them, uh, but, but also to people amongst them as well. Um, and I think finally, the thing that we've done is we've really tried to address some of the stuff around what they've missed out on. So we've just scheduled a valedictory ball and the students are just falling over themselves with excitement, at, you know, which is sort of something that we haven't done for a very, very long time. But it just seemed that that rite of passage that was missed out on is, is, um, is very important. And there's a lot of stuff that they can learn on the way to putting that together. So it's a student-led initiative. Um, you know, they're involved in the, the design of it in the music that's going to be chosen in the table layout, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's just building this sort of, um, you know, fantastic excitement. So, yeah, there's, there's some of the things that we're doing to support students and, and make them ready. And, um, you know, that working together is, um, I think, one of the hardest things for students when they go to university, they're not used to working in groups. So that student-led voice, that working in groups, working creatively, going along to workshops together, I think is really, really powerful stuff. Yeah, so that's it from us. Thanks, Elise. I think we underestimate, you know, those social skills you said that were nascent, that people didn't really have the opportunity to kind of foster for so long we don't really think about those things so thank you for bringing that to you know our own awareness as well did anyone want to um add to that anyone in the panel jason um or uh cameron before we move on to the next question i would like to just add a, a little bit to that um yeah. maria thank you um just really that with uh, when we think from the academic viewpoint for a moment in terms of what we're asking students to do the focus historically has been quite didactic in nature in that it's very much about the teacher um, being to some extent the, the expert um, and then uh, that delivery and focus on language instruction um, and but that's changing and we heard Cameron gave some some examples of how the technology is starting to affect that um, the implications in terms of academic integrity and those kinds of things well what, what underpins academic integrity and why it's important is it's about a value set. And I think um, we just heard a few moments ago about um, why that value set's important, that it's not just simply um, providing instruction to students and giving them the language skills. Of course, we want to do that, but it's also, so you, 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 you know, teachers still need to do that. But, the, but now the, there's these sort of other layers of how the technology is interplaying with that. And, and also in terms of the value set that um, we, we need to work with students to help them to use the pragmatics of language for the collaboration that, that um, uh, was just referred to a few minutes ago, that, that there's collaboration between um, students, um, peer groups, um, and, and these kinds of things that actually the, the, the way forward and that sort of um, the way that we, we're gonna to work together now in the kinds of jobs that students are going to have is going to, it's, it's mandatory that they, they need to know how to work collaboratively, um, how to ask questions, how to um, be polite in their, in their, in their um, interactions, and how to um, demonstrate that they understand how, where the value set that sits below that is sitting and is coming from, not just um, task take, um, tasks such as test taking, um, teach to the test, and can I, did I finish the course? That the value in their degree, for example, is going to be much more based around um, what they can understand, what they can do with the knowledge, not so much 
around did they achieve the task. So it's moving away from task and much more to do with relationships and deeper skills um, in the 21st century skills. And I think with all the, the support that you're talking about, it all comes down to the engagement um, and that initial frustration that we seem to be having with the online learning. Does anyone have any advice in the, in the panel about how we might break through that and be able to provide all these wonderful ideas that we have for the students? I don't necessarily um, have any advice, but um, listening to what you're talking about, we've been doing some research recently around um, English language proficiency of students and impact on wellbeing. And we have a course at the university called Palais, which is very much a course where students develop aspects of their English language proficiency in a real community. It's a very, very beautiful course. But one of the things that we've noticed and talking about developing the English language skills and continuing that engagement and conversation, so making it more of a social aspect than that didactic teaching um, of English language, we've been running focus groups and the students are very, very aware of the fact that they're not engaging and not communicating. So they will openly say, look, I am online, I can put stuff in the chat, but you know, it takes a long time to figure out what I need to say. And often if I can't figure it out, I'll put it in a translator. By the time I get it online, it's too late. The moment's being missed. Um, so if anyone has a wonderful remedy for how we foster that engagement and that communication, again, both in the face-to-face, -face, but also that online space. So students can continue to have the confidence in their English language skills, because what we're hearing is, I've lost my confidence. I haven't been immersed in an on-campus experience. I haven't practiced my English. I feel like I've gone backwards, but the opportunities I do have to engage in class, I won't because confidence again. So you guys are the experts. I'm hoping you'll be able to tell me how that all works and what, what we should be doing in our space as well. By no means an expert, but I've just got to say, you know, as educators, we create the culture of our classrooms. I think from day one, the culture is if it's a hybrid class, let's hear your voice. Uh, the chat's easy. I don't I don't want to read the, the chat. I want to hear your voice. And even better, if you've got the bandwidth, I'd like to see your face as well and really create that culture of uh, collaboration. That was the word that Jason used and that really stood out collaborative learners, uh, every opportunity uh, to collaborate is just so important. Um, I, I might offer just um, <laughs> one, one sort of slightly strange um, uh, possibility to people and, and it, it's something that has surprised us, but we have been doing a lot of food for students and food is the thing that um, brings the students to us and then with the food offering, we then build on that. And um, it, it's interesting that uh, uh, the university has also just done a little um, survey of what students want most. And it came back that the thing that they want most is free food. <laughs> All the things that we could give them right at the moment, it's free food. And um, look, it's, it's a gateway that, that, that brings the students in, they get engaged. You know, as soon as there's food there, there's a sense of generosity. People start talking with each other and you can really take that anywhere that you wanna go. So, you know, as, as I said, we've, we've looked at, um, you know, positive relationships. We've looked at, um, you know, getting ready for work. We've looked at, we're doing a little TikTok dance that we're gonna film on. Um, Saturday. So lots of different sorts of things that will engage a different students. But if there's food there, they will come. So it's a great strategy. <laughs> and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we had Domino's pizza yesterday for our students. So <laughs> it works. Um, I'd like to move on and just invite the uh, any comments from the audience? Because this is, we've got some fantastic information here. Let's see if anyone in the audience would like to comment on anything or ask um, the panel any questions. Can we open it up? Is there anyone brave out there? <laughs> Maybe not. Catherine, Catherine. 
Brandon has her name, has her hand up. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Kat. Thank you for the contributions panel. I'd, I'd love to know more about your projects, Elise. Where can we read more about them and what you what you did? Um <laughs> we'll find out more. Hmm. Um, you, you could have a chat to me, but yeah, look, really there were there were there, there's four big projects that we're involved in. So the, the the two projects around the character strengths of kindness and hope. Then um, this year we've done something that I call Plan C, which is actually about community building. And it's for the whole community because what we found is that the wellbeing initiatives that had psychoeducation and a whole lot of different activities and campus activations as part of them. The, the value was not just for students, it was actually for staff and students. Mm -hmm. And we've all been wounded, you know, we've, we've all, um, you know, lost things in the last two years and um, we've all been wobbled. And I think um, that, that was the really lovely thing about them. And probably this year, we, we've run a program that we've called Super Powered, We've, we've, um, we've stolen grilled sort of apostrophe D sort of ending for it as a little way, but it's got a whole lot of different components in it and it's all based around character strengths. And look, one great thing to do is, you know, the, the VIA um, website has um, a free character strengths assessment that you can do. Character strengths are this universal language understood around the world. They're the best of what it is to be human. And it's a great way to work with um, students um, to sort of think about, uh, you know, the things that are kind of blocking them or stopping them or that they're not doing as well and as, as they would like to, and to bring the focus back to what they're actually really good at intrinsically, it's, it, it's their strengths and to work from a basis of strength as opposed to a sort of deficit model. And unfortunately, in a, a lot of, um, you know, education, it is a deficit model because you focus on what you don't know, what you can't do, um, you know, what you failed in. Um, so it's it's a it's a great foil to that to you know that sort of insecurity and wobbliness that um, that that students suffer with and I think are particularly suffering with at the moment. So yeah, you know, look, there's there, there's a, there's a lot out there if you if you start digging a little bit. But I think character strengths are a, a great way to go. Thanks very much. Um, sorry, can I just add that I've been um, studying myself online for the last three years. And um, I really like what Elise is saying about the positive psychology aspect. And um, if you look at the research on self-determination theory, you can find that um, if a, a student or someone perceives support from their teachers or their, their boss, um, that support can actually influence your self-determination by about 38%. So I really think um, we should be trying to support our students and they should be trying to perceive that we really encourage and support them and that will help them with their self-determination to not take shortcuts but actually um, further their knowledge and their skills. Thanks, Jess. Has anyone else got something they'd like to comment on? While you're bravely trying to think of a way to engage, I'm going to ask the panel back again. Is there any other advice that you would have, um, just to wrap up, any other advice that you um, might give to our direct entry program managers and teachers um, to cope with this rapid recovery, if that's what we're in right now? Just a final comment, if you like. Just very quickly from me, be prepared, they're coming. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about changing curricula, I would say do so now because uh, it's an exciting time to be an educator and we know uh, we're going to be in high demand and there's not going to be a whole lot of time to, to make changes later on. Mm. Thank you. I've written that down. <laughs> um, I One thing that we... <laughs> um, look, I was going to say, I, I think that 
the um, students are really keen to um, engage in activities. They're keen to engage, but often they don't know how. So they, they need a, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of social engineering required or um, some other kind of a social lubricant to sort of, you know, like bring them together and open them up. But once you, you do sort of um, get them to open up a little bit, it's, it just goes in leaps and bounds. I, I, I was watching the students today and they're, they're so familiar with us now being back on campus and with each other and it's, you know, there's laughter. And for the first time yesterday, I had to close my door because there was so much noise coming out of the, the student lounge. So I think they really, really do want to be back, but they're just not sure how to. And I think, you know, if we're doing well, what we're doing is we're enticing them off the riverbank and back down into the river of life, you know, come swim with us. That's really what we want them to do. And, and I think that that's, you know, um, you, you've got to sort of have the, the supports there for them um, in terms of, you know, mental health and well-being, and you've got to have things to kind of lure them. And um, I, I just think that, you know, that we, we, we all need to kind of, um, you know, share a lot of love around, really, because, you, you know, that authentic relationship that, that we were talking about earlier, it, it's so important and students know when, when they're cared about, um, you know, they, they can harness that sort of hope that you have for them to do well. And, um, you know, they, they, they want it and they're ready for it. So I, I think we just need to <laughs> make it happen a little bit for them and then they'll make it happen for themselves. Jason, I think you were going to say something too. Uh, thanks, Maria. I'll, I've just got a quick point just to um, comment that uh, whilst the focus of today has been very much about students and how to um, support students through their journey through direct entry programs, uh, I would just comment that um, downloading the English Australia Best, Best Practice Guides uh, and reading those and applying those in your centre um, through professional development activities and supporting teachers is equally important that actually that's one of your leverage points that can give you by investing in your teachers and showing that you care about your teachers um, and the professional development of teachers over time, um, including um, it actually supports the, um, the initiatives that have been spoken about today, particularly from Elise, in terms of supporting student wellbeing, that if your teachers are also um, have strategies uh, for um, engaging with students, not just in the classroom, but how to connect, how to help students to connect with your support programs, then you're really building, um, you know, the um, momentum for success of your program. Thank you. I think that's a great point, Jason. I think professional development for academics in supporting our students, I know there are some are on shore now, but you know, when we do get this new rush to have the skills and, um, you know, the strategies ready to go to hit the ground running when that real rush does come back to us um, so that everything's in place and everyone feels supported. So both the students and academics all round. It's a really good point. Thank you. And maybe some Sav Blanc along with the pizzas. So, you know, <laughs> The academics really do feel well supported. I'm not sure that might help. Well, you he say social lubricant, so <laughs> possibly. Um, Cameron, did you have any last comments? Or? No, my was the advice of the scouts be prepared. Okay. Um, Anne Marie, did you want to ask the panel? Uh, sorry, the, the audience. Um, before. Yes, is there anyone brave enough now? <laughs> are there any comments? Um, we have a, another minute or so. Does anyone have any other um, comments or anything for our panellists before we let them relax a little bit? I don't have any pizza to give you to ask you to, <laughs> to, to, to help you to ask a question. <laughs> Looks like there is someone with a hand up. Um, I can't see. I can't see it. Uh, Hi. 
Hi, um, I just wanted to, to comment earlier in the discussion you were discussing, um, I think it might have been, been Cameron perhaps talking about um, the need to get full participation through through hybrid learning and having students sort of switching on their cameras and unmuting and, and actually participating. It was earlier in the discussion and as it happens while I'm listening here I'm currently in the middle of a huge teams debate with my own team about this very issue. Um, we find that um, I'm working as a learning advisor like Cameron so I'm sort of beyond the deck direct entry program but we're finding students who are coming into the university are going to lectures where they're not expected to participate. Okay, so when they come to us and we're delivering support programs and, and workshops, they're not participating at all. And it's, um, it's a real challenge. We're finding it very hard to get students to switch on their cameras and unmute or, or even use chat at times. And um, I think what's interesting is when we have a group of educators like ourselves working in direct entry programs, and then we hit up against a culture that's established by the universities we're preparing our students for, there's sometimes a mismatch between our expectations and perhaps university expectations. I was wondering if anyone else has experienced that. No. <laughs> Yes, you shed a light on that. It, it is, um, there is a gap, and I think also there's a gap between industry and, and university and what we're trying to teach as well. So I've noticed that too. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, I agree, Sue. Very well said. I, I just, it reminds me of, I think last semester, we did an integrated workshop where we would come in and, and present a like a guest lecture spot. And there were two different classes and one total interactivity amongst uh, students online cams on you couldn't get them to shut up basically uh, and it was a pleasure and then the other class a, a random word in the chat so again it it comes back to that you know culture of the classroom being set up by the educator yeah i think a little bit of I just thought I'd add to that a little bit. Thanks, Sue. You've generated a really good discussion point um, for all of us, I think. Um, I, the, one of the key words that's coming up for me is that I'm hearing um, both in what you said, what Cameron said earlier, um, what Sharon's referred to, is, is the, this word culture. So um, culture and collaboration are kind of quite closely linked. What's the key to culture? Language. So that's where the language component is really key. Um, that. We, we need to move students away from task taking um, and from you know or assessments and, and tasks and uh, of course that they'll they'll complete that as part of their studies in a, in a given lesson on a given day but we need to move them away from that idea of um, preparing for test taking and results that shouldn't be the only focus so of course they're going to be interested in how do I pass but how do we get there and why why are they why are they doing what they're doing so we need to work more closely I think the culture is linked with with dealing with the why, not so much the what, because um, we're already very good at the what. Now we need to really work with students on the why. And so we're not going back to some, I hear, I still hear quite a few, few of our teachers, for example, will say, well, when we go back to what it was like before the pandemic, now the students are arriving on, on campus. Well, we're not going back. Actually, yeah. we're going to something completely different and new um, with students on campus, but it's very different. So um, it's helping with that culture change, I think is really important. I also think in terms of the culture, sometimes it's down to the university or the faculty that you work in as well. I think um, I get a sense that we might have made it too easy for students to disengage by not having rules in lectures, such as if you have the bandwidth, you must have your camera on. You know, unmute the microphone, ask the question, let's not rely on the chat all the time. And that's just become an easy fallback. I know for lectures, even when I give workshops, that I have no expectations that people will turn on a camera, even though I encourage them. I know nobody's going to speak. I know that somebody might put something in the chat. And I think perhaps, and it depends on which uni you're at, you might have a fabulous culture, but I know that we certainly need to change our mindset um, in the business school and, and really enforce those approaches 
to get that engagement and the communication um, happening again. Thank you. Shall we move on? Thank you very much to our, our panel. Um, much appreciated and a lot of food for thought there. And we can still um, explore some of that in the breakout rooms and through the feedback at the end as well. Um, yeah. I'd like to do a little round of applause there. Yeah, thank you so much to the <laughs> panelists. Some real food for thought there. And, and some of it will feed into our breakout rooms, which we're going 